I don't know if you saw the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. I saw half of it until the power went off on the uh, cavern site we were staying on. But the bit I did see, it fascinated me as each country came in with their national flags and some were walking in and some were marching in and some were doing all sorts of weird and wonderful <laughs> things as they were coming in, dancing and, and whatever. you. And it just got me thinking about all the different nations of the world and we talk about and sing Christ for the whole wide world, don't we? I think it's like, like 220 countries take part in the Olympic Games and the Salvation Army is in about 130 or so countries. So we've still got a way to go if we want to be in all 220. Um, but nevertheless, we do preach and sing um, Christ for the whole wide world. I came across a story I want to just share with you before we sing our first song this morning. Samuel Walcott, he was the pastor of the Plymouth Congregational Church in Cleveland, Ohio, when the local branch of the YMCA, they asked to hold a meeting in his sanctuary. Now, Walcott not only agreed to allow their meeting, but he also made it a point to attend. And as he listened to the speakers, he couldn't help but notice the large banner that the YMCA sponsored had hung over the pulpit to announce the theme of the rally. The banner read, Christ for the world and the world for Christ. Christ for the world and the world for Christ. Walcott was very much in sympathy with that map with that motto he'd been a missionary and he'd served overseas for many years and he knew the need that existed in other countries but he also thought about his home city of Cleveland and the other cities of the US and and beyond that needed Christ well Walcott had tried his hand at hymn writing on a previous occasion and he was surprised when his hymn was published well seeing the motto Christ for the world and the world for Christ he was inspired to write the song that we're going to sing just now. Christ for the world we sing. Verses 1 and 2 of this song speak of those in need of Christ, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn. I've got a funny thing, this may be the only song in the songbook that uses the word sin sick, but I could be wrong. I'd be uh, happy to be proved wrong. Verse 3 anticipates that those whom Christ has redeemed from dark despair will share the work of spreading the gospel. And verse 4 celebrates the joy of seeing people who previously lived in darkness, enjoying the light of their new lives as Christians. Well, Walcott wrote 200 hymns or so during his lifetime, but this is the only one that's in the songbook. It's 917. first together Christ for the world we sing the world to Christ we bring with one accord with us the work to share with us reproach to dare 
with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Amen. It's um, it's difficult singing along to what I would define as uh, canned music, almost. Um, if you're um, singing along to a piano, you can sort of take your cue for the pianist as to when uh, the next verse is going to start. But of course, when you're listening to something on, uh, you know, electronically like that, it's not quite so easy to do. You know it's coming, but you just don't know it's where. It's a slap in the face with whipped fish. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's that bad, but uh, yeah, okay. Okay. We're going to sing another song, and uh, this is one of the, uh, well, I was going to say it's one of the oldest in the song book. It's nearly 400 years old, and uh, it was written by George Herbert. Now, he was another prolific hymn writer, and what makes this song unique is that the first line and the last line of the verse was actually originally written as the chorus, but most um, people, when they put these hymn books together, they thought, it doesn't look very good and it doesn't sound very good like that. So I'm just going to incorporate it all in as a verse. So it's number 41, which is uh, right on the front of your sheet. Yeah. Number 41, let all the world in every corner sing, my God and King. And when you, when you look at these words, you think, oh yeah, that makes sense that that was perhaps written as a chorus because it sounds the same at the beginning and at the end of each verse. But we're going to sing this together just now. corner sing including this corner of the world that we find ourselves <coughs> in sing our god and king interesting uh, little fact about that song is that the first time i ever sang that was actually in the singing company it was um, a song that was always brought out on a sunday when the singing company leader wasn't around and uh whoever was leading the singing company didn't know quite what to do with us so we used to sing that it was short and sweet and to the point but anyway there you go we're going to uh, turn now to prayer. And uh, what I would like you to do is, um, during this prayer time, I'm going to say the words, Lord, in your mercy. And I would like you to respond with the words, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would show us what it means not to work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which is provided by your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, we pray for all Christians around the world. We particularly ask for your protection for Christians who are persecuted because of their faith. We pray for our core. We ask for your guidance for all who have leadership responsibilities here. May they always be aware of the blessings you bestow on them, 
strengthen and uphold them when they grow weary in their work. We ask for your blessing on our core as we seek to create a church community that welcomes visitors and strangers and provides help and nourishment to people in every type of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for your whole creation, for our brothers and sisters throughout the world and for their lives to be respected, regardless of creed or colour, gender or sexuality, wealth or status, and for responsible sharing of precious resources and the conservation of our fragile and beautiful world. We pray for our government and all world leaders and the responsibilities that they have in bringing justice and peace to all. In a moment of silence, I would like you to pray for any country that's on your mind and heart at this time. Father God, we pray that the people in this country will continue to do what is right to reduce the risk of coronavirus spreading more widely and having an adverse effect on the NHS. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for the hungry in our world. May they receive the help that they need. For those who hold the power to feed others, let them be guided by your grace. For those who struggle with food and eating, may they receive support. For those who sit at a table of sickness, loneliness, grief or fear, may they know your nourishing love. Again, in a moment of silence, I would like you to pray for anybody who is on your mind today who is in need of God's healing power. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Faithful God, <coughs> fill our hunger with the food that lasts and enables us to share your love with people that we meet during the week ahead. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd like us to uh, listen to a piece of music just now. It's entitled, Come Into Our World.
about you, but um, I'm really struggling at the moment to try and uh, sing congregationally. I think it's because I'm out of practice, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, I don't know if you're finding the same issue, but uh, the old vocal cords uh, need a bit of exercise, I think, <laughs> to, uh, to get working properly and to sing properly. So we're going to sing a song now that uh, hopefully that might help. This is a song that starts off slow and uh, it gets a little bit faster as we, we go on. It's uh, number 875 and uh, it's entitled Jesus Put This Song Into Our Hearts. It's a song of joy no one can take away. Jesus put this song into our hearts. And of course he taught us how to live in harmony, how to be a family, and Jesus turns our sorrow into dancing. So uh, hopefully, uh, as, as we go on in this song, uh, you, you, your vocal cords will warm up, so to speak, and you'll be able to keep up with the music as it gets to the end. That's the music track uh, provided by uh, the music department at Territorial Headquarters. So if you don't like it, blame them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And in the Sunday school version, you, you go even faster. There's a fifth verse. You just go, la, 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 la. That's it. Yeah, you do a bit of a dance across the room. I've got it down as being a Graham Kendrick song. I don't know if it is one of his or not, but if it is, it's certainly one of his early ones. 1986, wow. Okay. <laughs> 35 years ago. Okay. 
we're going to turn to scripture and to uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Well-known words to many of you. It's entitled, The Parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord with your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. Well, may God give us understanding to the reading of his word this morning. Now we're gonna sing two songs now in contrast. The first one uh, isn't too fast, it's uh, song number 699. And I chose this really because although it doesn't mention the word world as such, it mentions mountains. And I know uh, it's probably not referring to the mountains you see out and about. It's referring to the mountains that uh, are in our own lives, so to speak. Um, I don't know if you watched earlier, I'm certain it was in um, a program called uh, Craig and Bruno's Road Trip. Did you watch that this week? Um, it's, it's an interesting program. They're going around the UK in, in a car. And uh, I'm certain they, they got to one point and one of them said something about um, some mountains. And someone said to them, they're not mountains, they're hills. Now I'm guessing the difference between a mountain and a hill is you have to climb a mountain where you can walk up a hill. I don't know. But not the Rocky Mountains. You've been on the Rocky Mountains? Excellent. I've been there. Okay. But I mean, people do have mountains in their lives and sometimes they seem insurmountable. But we do have a God who cares and loves us so very much. And it says in this song, grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown, he will provide. We just need to ask him for it. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. <laughs> The beautiful words, and uh, we're going to sing them just now. <laughs> Yeah. 
389 follows on from that in many respects. <coughs> and you might be thinking, well, I don't see how it follows on. But in verse 3 of this song says, Though we are weak, His grace is everything we need. So if we're going forth in grace alone, His grace is everything we need we're made of clay but this treasure is within he turns our weaknesses and we may feel sometimes like we've got an awful lot of those he turns our weaknesses into his opportunities so that the glory goes to him rejoice christ is in you the hope of glory in our hearts he lives his breath is in you arise a mighty army we arise you know, it might not feel like, uh, you know, we're sitting in a tent and it's raining. We might not feel like a mighty army, but there's a great cloud of witnesses out there who are worshipping and praising God today along with us. And, uh, you know, like a mighty army, we do need to arise and tell people about Jesus. Let's sing together. Rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope, the glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you. Arise, a mighty army, he arise. Now is the time for us to march upon the land into experience of life will be different to mine but let me tell you um, growing up in the 1970s and early 80s my world seemed pretty simple being religious as far as I knew meant being a Christian 
I didn't know any Jews or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists. I didn't even really know anything about their faiths. But today things are different, even if we don't always notice it. Mosques, synagogues and temples are everywhere. We may not take much notice of them, or much, take much notice at all. But buildings used by other world religions are not that difficult to find throughout this land. You know, it's common to hear people say, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. You may have heard one or two people say that. People who speak of themselves in such a manner tend to be theologically eclectic and often stay clear of the kinds of religious communities that I've just mentioned. They're concerned that such entities, whether big or small, Christian or not, might put boundaries on their ability to pick and to choose what they believe and practice. With all of this religious diversity, from the institutional to the non-institutional, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or perhaps better, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in today's world? Now, to get this admittedly rhetorical conversation started, I'm going to give you a definition of what it means to be a Christian. Now, your definition may differ from this one, okay? That's fine if it does, because this is just the beginning of the conversation. A Christian is a follower of Jesus, whose life is formed by a relationship with the God whom Jesus revealed to the world. When he took on flesh, lived and died, and then was raised from the dead, so that in him all things might be made new. And I think a Christian also is someone who loves God with all of their heart, their soul and mind and strength, and loves their neighbour as themselves. Now, your definition may add or subtract to that. It probably adds to it, I would imagine. But hopefully, we can all agree that if we love God and seek to follow Jesus, then this relationship with God will impact the way that we live our lives. In order for us to stay in relationship with God, we need to nourish that relationship by spending time in God's presence. You know, there's many spiritual practices that can aid us in nurturing the faith that we profess. We can talk to God through prayer. We can listen for God's voice in quiet meditation. We can read and contemplate the scripture, aided by other devotional or theological works. There's music, there's nature, which stirs our souls and leads us back to the God who made all of this possible. Nurturing this relationship can and should happen both in moments spent alone with God and in moments spent in the company of others such as this. This love for God, which is nurtured by our faith practices, should lead us naturally to loving our neighbour. As the prophet Micah put it, God has called us to do justice, love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 verse 8, by the way, if you want to look it up. But who is this neighbour that we're supposed to love? That's what the lawyer, the expert of the law, wanted to know. He wanted to know where the boundaries were. From the nature of the discussion, it would appear that this neighbourhood was smaller than that of Jesus's. Jesus answered the lawyer's question, with a parable that turned his world and ours upside down. It wouldn't be a priest or a Levite, the religious leaders of the day, who would exemplify the love of neighbour. Instead, it would be a Samaritan. The suggestion, I'm guessing, might have repulsed this, uh, this legal person, this lawyer, who likely viewed Samaritans as dirty, evil, and detestable. To get a sense of his surprise, perhaps think in terms of an illegal alien from, well, anywhere you like, really. Uh, 
giving aid to someone with wealth and influence in the community. Miranda's Gandhi, he wasn't a Christian, but he offers us a good example of the kind of neighbour Jesus is envisaging. It's interesting that Jesus was one of the influences on Gandhi's ethic of non-violence. He took seriously Jesus' call to turn the other cheek, and he used it effectively to lead his people to independence, in part by reminding the British of the teachings of their own faith. Gandhi, I'm sure, would have appreciated the question everyone was asking a few years back. What would Jesus do? Although Jesus didn't give us instructions on how to deal with modern technology or national policy discussions, it did show us how to love God and how to love our neighbour. I don't know what kind of car he would have driven. It's an interesting debate, isn't it, if you wanted to chat about something. What kind of car would Jesus have had if he'd had a car? Maybe not. I don't know. He was known for walking. I do think Jesus would have agreed with Micah when the prophet says that God requires of us justice, loving kindness and humility as we walk with God. Martin Luther King had a dream that one day his nation would rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Well, it's not yet true in America, and dare I say, we've not really reached that pinnacle here either. Racism and discrimination are still with us. Christian preachers continue to disparage Islam, Muhammad and Muslims. Then there's the issue of immigration, which is a bit of a hot topic at the moment. It's one that our nation has been unable to resolve. In calling us to love our neighbour, I believe that Jesus wants us to work for the good of everyone, no matter their religion, politics, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, race, or social class. And although we fall short in this calling, sometimes things begin to change for us when a new relationship stirs us to action. Being a Christian means being an advocate for justice, and that means advocating for the equality of all human beings, even those we may not agree with. Christian faith leads to compassion and mercy towards others, no matter who they are. The Samaritan didn't ask the injured man about his religion, did he? He didn't ask about his race or where he came from. He was simply moved with pity for a person in need. Consider Mother Teresa. She didn't ask about the background of the lepers that she served in India. She saw the need and she got on with it. Being a Christian though means also being humble. Humility recognises that we don't have all the answers. It leaves room for doubt and it allows us to listen to the voice of others. We like to be right, don't we? We like our answers to be black and white and clear cut with no shades of grey. But in today's postmodern pluralistic world, we need to be ready to hear God's voice in unexpected ways. Disciple pastor Jan Lin, in her book, How to Be an Open-Minded Christian Without Losing Your Faith, of speaking, um, speaks of living with clear ambiguity. It's a funny phrase, isn't it? Clear ambiguity. That is, sometimes the answers we seek are as clear as mud. As Christians living in the 21st century, we face difficult and complicated questions. And often we don't have a clear and unequivocal word from God. Issues like the environment, uh, immigration, war, homosexuality, the use of alcohol, and the role of women in the church, for instance, all stand before us. Although that last one, perhaps, the role of women in the church, the Salvation Army has got almost 
uh, right. It's still got a little way to go, but it's, it's getting there. Devout Christians take stands on all sides of those arguments. And it takes humility to stop and listen to the other side. History can help us in this. Remember that in the 19th century, many Christians believed that it was okay to have slaves. Today, I think most of us would agree it's not. We abhor slavery in all its forms. It isn't easy being a Christian, is it? But then justice, compassion and humility don't come easily. Fortunately, we have a loving and gracious God who is slow to anger and quick to show mercy. God's wondrous grace allows us to take risks. If we fall, the Spirit is there to lift us up. And so as we consider our calling to be a Christian in the world today, I want to remind you of the words of St. Francis of Assisi, a beautiful prayer that's been attributed to him. He says, and let's make this our prayer as well, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let's sing another song together, 364. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Let's give thanks just now.
Let us pray. Jesus, we want to give thanks this morning with a grateful heart. We want to be able to say if we're weak that we are strong through you. If we're poor, we can say that we are rich through you because of what you've done for us. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. Maybe it's something a little bit different to what we're used to, but you have been at the very centre of all that's taken place this morning, and I thank you for that. Help us to rejoice and to praise you in all circumstances, in all situations and wherever we may find ourselves. Help us to remember that if we don't, the very rocks that are around us, the nature will, will sing its praises to you, Lord. Help us, though, to be humble and faithful and loving and compassionate and kind and gracious to those that are around us. The world needs Jesus, and it needs to see you, Lord, through our lives, that you matter to us and that you can make a difference to anyone and everyone. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to listen to a song. Before we have our, our closing um, song, we're going to listen to a piece of music. The words will be on your song sheet. And uh, this is the Pasadena Tabernacle Songsters singing a beautiful piece called Almighty. Now, this is one of my favourite songster pieces. I don't know if we've sung it here or not at this, but um, it, it's a great piece of music and uh, it's entitled Almighty. <laughs> Oh, 
There's some high notes in there. Aren't you glad you didn't have to sing it? Okay. Well, we come towards the end of our meeting now. And we're going to finish with one final song. It's number 925. This will send us on our way into the week. And it says, let us go out into the world, the world that needs Jesus. Let us go out into the world with love in our hearts. Love is patient, love is kind, leave selfishness behind. Let us go out into the world with love in our hearts and with joy and with faith. And let's go with Christ into this new week. So it's 925. Let's sing together. go out into the world with Christ in our hearts. Now benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 May God bless you this coming week.